right now, Lord, we bless you, God, we praise you, hallelujah, Lord, we magnify you, God,
just can't stop praising his name. I just can't stop praising his name, Jesus. I can't stop praising his name. I just can't stop praising his name. I just can't stop praising his name, Jesus. joy. Clap your hands, make a joyful noise. Blow the trumpet and shout, praise and for the victory. Weapons we use are not bombs and guns. Worship is the way that the battle is won. This is the way that we fight, praise and for the victory.
give you the glory. And hallelujah, we give you the praise. And we will praise you for the rest of our days. Yes, we will praise you for the rest of our days. Hallelujah in the sanctuary. Hallelujah, we give you the glory. Hallelujah, we give you the praise. And we will praise you for the rest of our days. Yes, we will praise you for the rest of our days. In Jesus.
Jesus, thank you, Jesus. You can make your way to your seat. Praise the Lord to everybody. Good to see everybody here today. Amen. Hopefully you came expecting something great from God. Amen. Something in your life, a need met. Amen. I'd like to see somebody leave with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Speaking in tongues. Amen. If you've never been drunk on the Holy Ghost, you've never really been drunk. Amen. Hey, praise the Lord. And uh, you know what? You can, you can do all kinds of things in the world. You can get high on whatever they got. You can drink the alcohol and get drunk on that stuff. And man, wake up with a hangover and, and uh, coming down from whatever it is. Uh, but with the Holy Ghost, you don't have any of those troubles. Amen. It's the best thing you'll ever have and ever feel. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so, anyway, I'm glad I know what the Holy Ghost is. Amen. Everybody had a good week? Good day so far? Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, summertime is uh, now, and it's hot. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, hallelujah. Uh, so glad to have Brother Addison here with us today. Got him for the whole day uh, this morning and, and tonight as well. Amen. And, uh, and then his family, his daughter, and uh, um, help me, brother, I'm going to try it, M Mardanica. Is that close? Is that good? All right. Amen. Now, uh, I asked her if she sang. She said no. So, <laughs> amen. We are glad she's here. Her, her two youngins are here, and I think they might be passed out by now. And, but anyway... We're so glad they're here. Uh, and Brother Addison said he was going to have a, sh uh, a, um, a chauffeur. And so she, she drive, drive, drove him most of the way here. And uh, anyway, I, I like what he said. He was talking. He said he taught his kids how to drive so that whenever they got old enough to, he wouldn't have to. <laughs> so it sounded like a pretty good plan. I'm, I'm working on that right now with my 12-year-old. My goodness, he wants to drive everywhere. Amen. But we're going to hear from uh, him in just a little while. Going to preach the word. I'm excited about it. And uh, been knowing Brother Addison for a while. And, uh, and his family. And he's got uh, four uh, children of his own. And uh, we know him from youth camp mostly. We've seen him for Brother Couch's meeting when we go. And just all around. Uh, great, great guy, good friend of mine, so we're glad that he's here, and uh, can't wait to hear the word of the Lord. Um, Brother Joy, if you'll help us real quickly, we'll get the offering out of the way, and uh, and I'll, I want to give you all time to um, give God some glory. I almost said exhort, but uh, that'd take a little while, amen, so if you do have a testimony today, uh, we want you to uh, stand and give God some glory. I want to say real quickly, glad to see all my peoples back there. Made it back to church. Amen. Amen. Sister Wendy and Brother James been bringing these these uh, elders from, from the uh, Oak Ridge. And, and so glad y'all are here. And, and good to see Brother Doyle and Sister Jimmy. Amen. Amen. Look like you're getting stronger. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Anybody have a testimony this morning? Brother James.
Amen. Somebody else? It's Wendy. Hallelujah. Somebody else? Amen. They say a lot of things. They call us a lot of names now. Right. Who was it that I did I send that article to somebody? Maybe I sent it to the whole church about the twenty percent of the US or thirty percent is all that's left that believe the Bible is the word of God. Twenty percent of the United States population. Now I don't know where they got that poll number from. And it and it may not be it may not be exactly accurate, but it's headed to a lower number than that. And uh, um, one of the fascinating things that they said about the Bible was it was a, a book of fables, a book of mystical uh, characters, and uh, and and some other names. <laughs> My goodness. And they think the world's doing all right. Amen. The courts have reversed some rulings and people are just falling apart because their, their, their freedoms are being taken away and their rights. And uh, I'll tell you what. Ah, uh, my, my. The Bible said there'll come a day when we look up and say, God, come back quickly. Would you hurry up? It's getting worse, getting bad. Amen. You'll be hated of all men for my namesake. The world's not going to want to have anything to do with Jesus or his name or his people. And so, you know what? They're going to call you all kind of names. Amen. Anybody else have a testimony this morning? Amen. I, uh, my, my boy is always complaining about me being long-winded. My younger boy, he's like, Daddy, don't preach long today. So, Brother Addison, he's, he's, he's ready to go. He's going to take care of that today. <laughs> Amen. Hey, I tell you what, that boy needs to get a hold of the Word of God in his heart. <laughs> uh, he's he's going to get there. Amen. Nobody else want to testify this morning? Anybody else? Mama. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I remember that touch you got right up here at the front on April, I believe it was April 23rd or something like that. We had a youth youth rally. I mean, Brother Putman was here. Others was here. And uh, my wife, no, it might have been the Sunday before then. I don't remember. Anyway, my wife and her was praying together, got the same exact feeling and touch and confirmed it with one another and ever since then God been taking care of that cancer amen, amen. it's gone zero percent today amen the doctor was amazed and she said well I've never had this happen before zero percent but and uh, so she had to throw in a technicality there brother she had to say well it's zero point three percent of of some in two of the lymph nodes and uh anyway just give god credit yeah. hallelujah give god praise god did that god touched her body amen he's a healer anybody else yeah. all right alec or levi <laughs> y'all got something to say uh, they're busy amen all right.
right, well, we're going to uh, get out of the way here real quickly and let Brother Addison uh, preach to us. And we're going to get behind him, get with him. Amen. I know he's been praying and studying, and I know that you know, he's known he's coming for a little while. And uh, I'm excited about what God's going to bring to the table today. Amen. Praise the Lord. We want to remind you, um, again, if, if you haven't got things ready for Brother Epley's meeting, motel-wise or whatever, we're going to go to that at the end of the month. Uh, that service, that midweek service, will have to be canceled. Um, and so uh, no, no church on that Wednesday of, of that week. Um, I think it's the 25th. But y'all have to look at that. And uh, anyway, that Wednesday, we'll all be at Brother Epley's meeting. Or most of us, anyway. So, uh, get ready for that. I don't think there's anything else coming up in, in July. Amen. So, praise the Lord. All right. How many ready to hear the word of the Lord? Amen. Amen. I'm ready. Brother Addison, I want you to come on, preach to us, obey the Lord. And uh, may I have to wake some of us up. It's all right. Just go back there and mess the hair up. Whatever you got to do. Um, push them push him back, push him out on the floor. <laughs> Whatever you got to do. No, we're, we're, we're thankful that he's here in, in his family. Amen. Everybody say God bless him. Let's get behind him. Amen. Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord. My I appreciate God tonight. I thank God for the Holy Ghost. I've been in church now, be 28 years. Got the Holy Ghost when I was 23. Um, God's been good to me. God's been so good to me. Uh, I want to thank Brother Smith for this invitation. And uh, thank them for their fellowship and their friendship. And... Uh, I'm glad to be apostolic. They've called us worse things than a cult. Yes. We've been called worse. and uh, But I'm glad that I'm a part of this cult. Yeah. I'm honored because this is where truth is. This is where God is. I, I was raised in a denominal church and uh, thought I was saved until I turned 18 years old. God introduced himself to me and um, I, I got the Holy Ghost when I was 18. But I didn't keep the Holy Ghost when I was 18. Right. Had the world in my mind, on my mind, and walked away from God when, um, after a few months of being in the apostolic church. And then I come back. I was telling Brother Smith, I come back um, when I was about 20. Didn't stay long. Stayed until I was, stayed a year. I stayed in church a year. Still had the world on my mind. And uh, when I turned 23 years old, God stepped into my room, into my living room. Me and my oldest girl was in there. My wife was at work one night. Just give you a little rundown on where God brought me from. And I was in my living room getting high. I was in there getting high. And my daughter, she was laid out on the couch because I was the babysitter. She was laid out on the couch asleep. And uh, I uh, heard a voice. Heard a voice speak to me and said, boy, no, he said, you better pray. And I thought I was hallucinating, brother. Thought it, was, thought it was the drugs dealing with my mind. And the uh, second time, that voice said, you better pray. It was stronger than the first time. And that third time, he said, boy, you better pray. And I got down on my knees, and I started praying, talking to God. And I spoke in tongues that night. But the next day, the very next day, I was right back doing the same old thing. Just right back doing the same thing. And um, a week later, me and my wife wasn't even married at this time. But a week later, I was at work. I worked at a liquor store. And I was at work, and that day, God dealt with me. I, I did not feel comfortable. I did not feel right at work. And, um, and I was just miserable all that day. And me and one of my uncles, we had planned to hang out together and, and drink and smoke that night. And... Um, and I was going. To, we was going to stay the night at his house, and uh, just just do our watch movies and do our thing that night. But by by midnight, when I got off, God had dealt with me so 
that uh, when I went into his house, I got into his house and uh, I had all we had bought the beer and all that, and and uh, I got into his house and he was like, "Hey man, let me have a cigarette." And I pulled the pack out of my pocket and I looked at him and I handed it to him and said, "You can have those." And I got up to go to the refrigerator, refrigerator, and uh, he said, uh, "Hey, bring me a beer out of there." I said, "Look, you can have it all." I said, all I want to do is use your den where I can go pray. And I went in that room, and I went and prayed, and I prayed through, and that was the last time I ever smoked a cigarette. That was the last time I ever got high. That was the last time I ever drunk a beer at the age of 23 years old, February the 16th, 1995. Well, February the 16th, 1996, I had just taught a young man a Bible study at my house. And uh, a buddy of mine, a, a friend of mine that went to church with me, he come by the house. He, he wanted to wash some clothes. And he come by the house and uh, picked us up. And the young man that I taught the Bible study to, uh, I asked him, I said, hey, do you want to go to the church and pray? And he was like, yes, sir. So we was headed. We went to the church and pray and come back. And we was going to head to town because the church is six miles from town. I lived I lived seven miles from town at the time. And, uh, and when we was pulling, he was pulling out of the driveway, a friend of mine was. He was pulling out of the driveway. And this was one year to the date. He pulled out in, the, in a Pepsi truck, the delivery truck, the big delivery truck, was coming down the highway. He never saw it. And he pulled out in front of that truck, and it hit the passenger side where I was sitting. They told me, because when it hit me, I went out. That man that was driving the truck that I was in told me, he said, Brother, I watched you when you took your last breath. He said, You just took a big gulp of air, and you stopped. He said, That was it. And uh, he said, uh, Somebody got a hold of Brother Couch, and Brother Couch come to pray, and they got there, and um, they came and prayed, and uh, he said he watched me the second time after Brother Couch was praying. He said he watched me just take a deep breath and start breathing. Yeah. And they, they told me, they said, the, they said the state trooper said, he said that when that truck hit our truck, said it picked the truck up, turned it around, and put it back in the ditch in the yard that we come out of. He said if it would have hit us different, it would have rolled and it killed us. But it was just God. It was just God. I, I was so thankful. I'm so thankful that I obeyed God that year prior. And I prayed through that year prior. And God's been good to this old boy. He's been good to me. And he, he, has, uh, he, has, he has brought me a long ways. 27, 28 years. It'll be 27 years that I've been back at Brother Couch's church. February will be 28 years that I've been in church, that I've had the Holy Ghost. Been preaching since 1998, and, uh, and God's been good. God has been with me, and he has worked with me, and he has helped me. God has been my helper and my strength and my salvation. Greetings from Liddyville. My pastor told me to tell you all hi. And uh, everything's going well in Liddyville. I thank God for that. He's working. And revival is on the horizon. And I thank God. Well, I was uh, Monday. It was a Monday. I was in prayer. And God spoke this, this thought to me. And, uh, and I was like, God, what am I going to do with that? I'm just sitting down there praying. Monday night prayer meeting, just praying. And I'm like, I don't know what to do with that. And come back to church Tuesday, and I was telling God, I don't know where this is going. I don't know where this is going. I don't know, you know. But I was praying about the thought, and Wednesday, Brother Smith texted me, give me a call. And uh, I did, and uh, then I knew where this was going. And I thank God. I thank God for talking to me and, and, and helping me. But uh, if you would, stand with me and turn to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 18, and then we'll be going to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 3. It's not nothing new. 
And I'm going to tell you right now, it's not nothing phenomenal. And it's not nothing way out there. Brother, Brother Smith told me, he said, well, we're simple people. Well, I'm a simple preacher. Right. Very simple. I don't have no new doctrine. Don't have a new revelation. And I told God, I said, God, when I heard this, when I was younger, when I was younger, I heard, I heard the preacher say that his pastor told him, don't pray for a new revelation, but pray that God would illuminate the old yeah. revelation. Yeah. And that's what I've been praying about. God, you illuminate the old. The things that you gave to Peter, James, John, the Apostle Paul, I want to learn those things. I don't want nothing new. I don't want nothing that's way out there. I don't want nothing that will cause folks to stray away from God, but I want the truth. And that's why they call us a cult, because they can't stand the truth. It's the truth that hit them in the face, and it, and it affects them in a positive or a negative way. Most of them, it's a negative way. And when they look at truth, and they look at all the apostolic ways, they say, hey, they're a cult because they're too strict. But Jesus had to be a cult member because he's the one that laid out the foundation. He's the one that laid out the word. So I thank God for truth. Book of Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse number 15 says, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren like unto me, and unto him ye shall hearken. According to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. This is Moses rehearsing what went on in the wilderness. He's in the wilderness, but he's rehearsing some things to Israel, things they had spoken to him when they met God in the mountain. And he's just rehearsing their travels through the wilderness. Verse 17, And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 15. It says, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Brother Smith, would you pray? Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. amen. You may be seated. With the help of God, I'm going to try to tie these two verses together, these, these settings of scriptures together. But as I said, God, Moses was in the wilderness, and they was getting ready to cross over Jordan, and he was getting ready to die. And Moses was taking the time to rehearse the commandments, the laws, the statutes, the precepts, the testimonies of God. And he was rehearsing Israel's attitude and their ways and tell them how he was telling them how they were and telling them what they had done. He was just causing them to remember, you know, you had it good at one time, but you chose to disobey God and you chose not to follow after God the way that God wanted you to follow after him. And so... There in that wilderness, I don't know if it took a day, I don't know if it took a week, I don't know how long it took him to rehearse all these things to the children of Israel, but there came the point when he told them that God is going to raise up a prophet from among your brethren like unto me. He's going to raise this man up. I don't. He didn't tell him when, and he didn't tell him how, 
He didn't tell them what tribe they was coming out of. He was coming out of. He just said, God said, he was going to raise up a prophet. And he was going to be like unto me. And so God called Moses to lead the children out of Egypt when he was in the land of Midian. And God called Moses to go stand before Pharaoh. And Moses went and stood before Pharaoh and he declared, Thus saith the Lord, let my people go. But Pharaoh, in his hard heart, heartedness, he refused to let Israel go. And after ten plagues, he thrust Israel out of Egypt. He had had enough. God was wiping out his land and Pharaoh was had, he had enough. But there came a time when as they was wandering in the wilderness, walking through the wilderness before they got to the Red Sea, uh, uh, Pharaoh come with a change of mind and he decided he was going to chase them and recapture them and bring them back into Egypt. And he chased them down to the Red Sea and there at the Red Sea, the whole Egyptian army died. And while Israel, when they crossed the Red Sea, when they got to the other side, God introduced himself to Israel. They, they knew about God, but they didn't know God. But God introduced himself to Israel in the Mount Horeb. And while they was there in Mount Horeb, they looked up and God was wanting to show himself to them. And when they saw the lightning and they saw the smoke and when they saw the fire, when they heard the thunder and they heard the voice and they heard the sound of the trumpet, they were afraid. And they looked at Moses and they told Moses, you go and you speak to God for us. Because if God come and speak to us, we're going to die. And Moses said to the people, fear not, for God has come to prove you and that his fear may be before your faces that you sin not. So Moses was chosen by God to speak to the people and he was chosen by the people to go talk to God. He was that intercessor between God and man. And when God's anger was kindled, every time God's anger was kindled, against the children of Israel, it was that man of God that stood before God and said, don't you kill him. God told Moses one time, he said, uh, move out of my way, Moses, that I may destroy him. And Moses, the intercessor that he was, he said, God, if you destroy them, you blot my name out. And God looked on that, and he hearkened to the voice of the man of God. And God let him know. He said, I'm going to get rid of them, but not, not in that way. I will get rid of them. But Moses was that man of God, that God, that prophet that God raised up to lead Israel out of Egypt. And he promised them that he was going to raise up another prophet out of the, out of the land of Israel from among them. And through the years, the people of Israel, they looked and they searched and they wondered about that prophet. They searched for him. And when John come along, they asked him, said, who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Art thou Elias? He said, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, no. Then said they unto him, who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What says thou of thyself? But as they wondered, and as they questioned, and as they looked, they missed that one. They missed that prophet. They didn't, they didn't realize that he was in the midst of them. They answered, they were, they were in a, they was in a debate, and, and Nicodemus, he was sitting there, and he said, he was telling them, hey, does not our law require that a man be examined first before he be judged? And they looked at Nicodemus and they said, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee arises no prophet. They was looking at Jesus. They had read the scripture. They knew the scriptures. They knew every verse. They knew every chapter. These Pharisees, these Israelites, they knew every verse about the coming Messiah. 
But in their mind, somewhere in their mind, they had conjured up another picture of that prophet. They had conjured up in their mind their own version of what he was going to be like. They, was, they, they didn't understand that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in the city of David. They was just looking at, hey, this man is a Nazarene. He's out of the coast of Galilee. He's not, he's not, he can't be that prophet. He cannot be that prophet. But he was. And there were others, many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, of a truth, this is the prophet. That was the common people. That wasn't those religious groups. It was the common people that looked at Jesus and recognized this is that prophet that Moses spoke about. This is that man that Moses was talking about. But some of them was confused. Others said this is the Christ. But some said shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem? where David was. So there was a division among the people because of him. And just as Moses was that intercessor between God and man, so was Jesus that intercessor for us. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2 and 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Hebrews 7 and 24 says, But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Romans 8 says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. John wrote and said, my little children, I write unto you that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus is that intercessor. When we do wrong and we deserve the punishment of God, he sprinkles that blood before God so that we can have our salvation. He's standing there making intercession for us constantly. He's, he's there in the heavens, make an intercession for us. He was that prophet like unto Moses, and he's standing there before the Almighty God. It's not two people. I'm not talking about two persons in the Godhead. I'm talking about the man Christ Jesus, the visible of the invisible, that's making intercession for us. But Peter preaching to those Jews at when, he, uh, when they healed that man at the beautiful gate, he was standing there and he had been preaching to them. And in Acts chapter 3, he said unto them, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive unto the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever ye shall say, he shall say unto you. Then Stephen come along in his defense when they was ready to kill Stephen. He was in his defense defending himself. He come along and said, this is that Moses which said unto, unto the children of Israel. A prophet shall the Lord your God Raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear. Jesus was that prophet that God promised to the children of Israel. When we look at Jesus, when most folks look at him, they look at him as just a, a man. But he was more than a man. He was more than just a man. He was that intercessor that stood before man, that stood between man and God. But God, God, he's the man of God is not that prophet like unto Moses that God prophesied about. But he is a prophet like unto Moses. You know, just as Moses 
tried to declare to God all of his flaws and the things that he couldn't do. You know, men, pastors, when they go to, when, when God called them, they in their mind, God, what am I? What am I that you call me to pastor? I can't do this. I'm not this. I'm not that. I'm not this. But God looked at Moses and said, who has made man's mouth? Who is it that created man? And, and he looks at men, I, and, and he calls men and looks at him and says, hey, I called you. I created you. You know, I know about your flaws. I know about your failures. But I have no other plan but to use a man. So God calls the man of God to lead and shepherd a church. Jeremiah 3.15 says, and I will give you pastors according to my heart. You know, I used to hear people say, God's going to give me a pastor according to my own heart. No. God never said he'll give you a pastor according to your heart. He's going to give you a pastor according to his heart. He's going to give you a man of God that's going to seek his face, search his ways, dig out of his book, search his scriptures, and preach to you the things that God put in his heart. You know, men that seek after pastors after their own heart, they find them. They find those men because our heart is deceitful. Our heart is desperately wicked according to the Bible. And when we look for men according to our own passions, we'll find a man that won't preach against sin. We'll find a man, if we go according to our own abilities, our own mentality, we'll look for a man that's going to soothe our conscience, that's going to that's gonna pat us on the back, that's going to just say, hey, you're doing good in what you're doing. You know, if, if we just go by how we feel on a daily basis, we want somebody that's going to just rub us down and say, hey, you know, God is good. God's going to bless you. God's going to keep you. That's why we got so many churches. That's why there's so many churches. Because folks want to go to the church after their own heart. They want to go to find a man of God after their own heart. They don't want a man of God after God's own heart. They don't want somebody that's going to preach to them the truth and tell them what's right and preach to them about hell. But God said, I'm going to give you a pastor after mine own heart that's going to teach you knowledge and understanding. He's going to feed you. And he's going to help you. Ephesians chapter 4 says that he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why did he do that? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Just as God called, the, called Moses to lead Israel, God called the man of God to lead the church. He didn't give you pastors. He gave you a pastor. God knew how he was. God knew his abilities. God knew his height. God knew his stature. God knew everything about him. But God looked at him and said, hey, I'm calling you to pastor a church. Amen. And so he come along, this man of God come along. He didn't tell me to preach this. He didn't call me and say, hey, lift me up, brother. No, he didn't call me. God gave me this. God gave me this. And he gave me this, he gave me this revelation when I, in my younger days. When I first started going to the church, he gave me a revelation of what the, the position of the man of God. And I learned a long time ago that it's God in the church. The authority is God, it's the man of God, and then the saints. It's not God and the saints and then the man of God. Don't look at the man of God like others have looked at him and said, hey, he's just a man just like I am. We put on our pants the same way, one leg at a time. I mean, you know, <clears throat> I'm bigger than he is. I'm taller than he is. That, that didn't matter to God. That does, your stature doesn't matter to God. God didn't say, hey, you, you know, you're just like him. Hey, the position. You got to look at the position. It's not the man. It's the position. It's where God put him in the church. It's the leadership that God put him in. 
and God called him to lead because we don't know how to walk right. We as saints, if you take us from under the covering, if you get from under the covering of the man of God, there's no telling where you'll go. Because you're, walk, you're walking after your own ways. You're going after your own mentality. And Jeremiah said, oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his step. The, 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 the preacher come along in the book of Proverbs, he said, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. When you're from under the covering of the man of God, the prayers in the hand of the man of God, you'll be wondering, and you'll wonder, am I going right? And you'll find yourself in a, in a place without God, without leadership, without real knowledge, and you'll think that I'm doing right. Because your own mind is leading you. And you'll think, hey, I'm just doing great. I'm, I'm on the road to heaven, and I'm just I'm doing wonderful. And, I'm, and God will send a man of God in your life, and you'll realize, man, I was going wrong all this time. I was going wrong all this time. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The kind of work I do, I'm outside all the time. And there's, and there's other companies that uh, they, they do the same thing. And uh, one, one of the men from the other company, that he, he, he asked my coworker to ask me, do we have to be faithful to church? And... Uh, and my reply was yes. And the man told him, he said, well, I knew he was going to say that. But this same man, he said, I don't have to go to church. He said, he said I have a relationship with God in the woods. It's just me and God in the woods when I go hunting. It's just me and God out there. And uh, God talks to me. And I was like, no, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. Because you don't have a pastor in your life. And you and God ain't going to have your own thing going on. Without, I, and, I, and I used that verse. When I told, when he, had, when he sent that question, I told my coworker, I said, you tell him. Those trees can't preach to him. I said, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Not the foolishness of hunting. Not the foolishness of camping. Not the foolishness of walking through the woods. But the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. If there's not a preacher, an apostolic preacher in your life, you're on your way to hell. You are hell bound because only the apostolic preacher is going to preach to you the word of God. Romans 10, 14 says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher. How are you going to hear the voice of God? God is not going to talk to you in the woods. God is not going to talk to you in the shopping mall. God is not going to talk to you in your car while you're driving down the road from one vacation to the next. God's going to put you in a church and he's going to put you under a man of God. And God is going to speak to that man of God. And he's going to tell that man of God this is what you declare to the people. And this is what you tell them how to live. This is the standard I, I want you to make. This is what I want you to preach about holiness. This is what I want you to preach about tithe. This is what I want you to declare in the church. It is our duty as saints of God that we would obey the men of God. It's our duty as saints of God that we submit ourselves to the pastor that God put us under. It's our duty. Because without him, we're lost. We are lost. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, and they that must give, an, give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. 
that they may do it with joy and not with grief. You obey the man of God and you submit yourselves to your pastor that it may be profitable for you. Because when you stand before God, you don't want to be like that fig tree that when Jesus came searching for fruit and he looked at that tree and there was no figs. Jesus knew there were no figs on that tree. But it had the show. It had the beauty of a blooming fig tree, a blossoming fig tree. And Jesus said, no man eat from, eat from you from henceforth forever. That tree didn't have an intercessor. But you want to be like that tree that was in the vineyard. That when the, when the Lord of that vineyard come along and he said, cut down this tree. Because I've come looking for three years and find, to find fruit. And I found none. And the husbandman, the pastor, the man of God said, Lord, give me another year. Give me one more year. Just let me dig around it. Just let me fertilize it. Just let me work with it, God. Just let me do what I got to do to try to salvage this tree. He's the intercessor in the church. He's that one when God said, look, I've had enough. That man of God is sitting there pleading, God, just give me a little more time. Just let me work with him a little more. Just let me try to do my best. And if it does not produce, then you cut it down. You see, God is not going to do nothing outside of what he does through the man of God. He's not going to go around. Now, if you don't have a man of God, and if there's not, it's just you and God, nothing in between. There's nothing between, and that's a dangerous place to be. That's dangerous. Saul got to that place. Saul didn't have nobody. He got to that place. God looked at the man of God and said, why do you continue to pray for Saul? Seeing that I have cut him off. I'm done with him. And that man of God was pleading. He was crying. Stayed up all night for Saul. And God was like, I've had enough. Because what Saul done, Saul didn't obey the man of God. He went out and done his own thing. He decided, hey, I'm king, and, and I'm big enough, and I can do my own thing. I don't need the man of God telling me what to do. I know he said, God go, said, go do this, but I'm going to do this my way. I'm going to do this my way. And God cut him off. You don't want to be in that place. When God spoke to the churches in Revelations, those seven churches, God didn't go to each individual. He did not go to each individual in the church and said, I want you to straighten up your act. I want you to get it right. But he went to, he wrote letters. He told John, you write to this church. You write to the angel. You write to the angel of the church. And you let the angel of the, the pastor of the church get this right. I want you to write to him and you tell him, this is what I looked at, this is what I found, and this is what I want done. This is what I want corrected. You don't go tell all the people in the church, I want you to write this letter to the angel of the church. God is not going to skirt around the man of God. God's not going to go around the man of God. He's going to go through the man of God because he's that intercessor between God and man. He's that prophet of the church. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's that man of God. And God called him to direct the church. And in your walk with God, and as you live for God, don't get cross. Whatever you do, whatever you do, I've seen it. Oh, I've seen it. Don't get cross with the man of God. Because when you get cross with the man of God, you're cross with God. When you get out of line with the man of God, you're out of line. I was, I was in Walmart, and there was a man there was a man that used to go to our church, and, 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 and it upset me because he, what he'd done and what he was seeing, he was seeing in front of his little kids. And uh, he had, you know, he had to grow out a beard. I mean, it was thick, and we was talking. And he said, I, he said, I got liberty to live like this. 
I live like this the way I am. He said, I'm free. I'm not under the rule of a preacher no more. And as we talked, and it scared me, it scared me so bad. I went and told Brother Kelly, I said, I just looked at deception in the face. I just saw my first time looking into the eyes of deception. And I told him who it was. He said, yes, yeah. But this man never wanted a man of God. He never, he was just there. He was just at the church because his, that's where his wife wanted to be. He never wanted to be under the rule of a man of God. And God gave him what he wanted. I watched that man at youth camp argue with his pastor. I watched him. And I walked away. This is beyond normal. This is not. He got crossed with a man of God, and that man is deceived to this day. He is very much lost and, and deceived. Cora and his company got to the place, and they got out of line with a man of God. Looked at Moses and said, Moses, you take too much upon yourself. We're the children of God. God speaks to us just like he speaks to you. Korah and Moses said, all right, Korah, tomorrow we'll find out. Tomorrow we'll see whose God man is. And the sad part about it, Korah was of the tribe of Levi. He was a priest. He was a preacher that got too big for his britches. He got too big for himself. And he looked at the man of God and said, you take too much. Upon yourself. The next day come around. Moses said let me tell you something Cora. God said. You take too much upon yourself. I didn't say this. But God said it. God told me to let you know Cora. You take too much upon yourself. And when God got done with Cora. Cora and his company. Went into hell. with all. They were the first ones. To ever go into hell in this manner. Alive. They went straight down into hell with their possessions. You don't cross the man of God. Romans chapter 13 and verse number 1 says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be, or it's not talking about governmental powers. It's the man of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisted the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works. If you're doing right, he's not a terror to you. But to the evil, wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister. God is talking about the preacher. He's not talking about the president. He's not talking about the governor or the mayor. God is talking about the preacher. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Who's conscience? Not your neighbors. Your conscience. You need to fear the man of God, not for your neighbor's conscience, but for your own. You may be six foot two, weigh 280 pounds, and he may be five two, weighing 106 pounds. It doesn't matter. He's the man of God. He's God's man. And you don't look down upon him and say, hey, I'm bigger than you. I'm stronger than you. I'm smarter than you. But he can look at you and say, the difference is I got a calling that you don't have. 
and that's and that outweighs your physical stature. For he is the minister of God to thee for good, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject not for not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute also. For they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man, any, you know, we use that verse, owe no man anything. And we, we, you know, we know we're supposed to pay our bills. But, but that's talking about you give to the ministry the respect that is due unto them. You owe no man anything, but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. I was asked a question. A brother, of my, a brother, a friend of mine asked me, he said, Brother, do we owe the ministry anything? I said, oh, yes, we do. And he said, do the ministry owe us? I said, oh, yes. I said, it's their job to feed us. It's their job to teach us. They owe us that. And it's our job to render and submit ourselves to the man of God. Let's all stand. It's our job to respect and to obey and to have that kind of relationship with the man of God that we're supposed to have. It's not our job. You can ask my daughter. You can ask my daughter. She'll tell you. Not one time did I ever come in my house. And run down the man of God. She's almost 30 years old. Not one time did she hear me come in and badmouth my pastor. All right. Not one time did we sit at the dinner table and discuss my pastor's flaws. Not one time. Did not one time did she ever hear me say, hey, me and the man of God, we're just alike. We put on pants just alike. He may be a little taller than I am. His skin may be lighter than mine, but we're both men. Not one time have my kids ever heard me say that. Because God put something in me a long time ago that says, hey, you better fear the man of God. It doesn't matter the flaws. I always told my kids, if he got flaws, God will deal with the flaws. If he makes a mistake, God will deal with the mistake. It's not my place, and it's not your place to try to straighten out the man of God. It's not, it's not our place to look at the man of God and say, hey, you done wrong. You made a mistake in, in correcting my child. You made a mistake at getting on to my, my child. You, you done wrong. No, if he does something wrong, you keep your mouth shut, and you let God deal with it. Don't even take it home. Don't take it to the dinner table. Don't take it to the bedroom. Don't take it to the car and discuss. You let God deal with it because God put him between you and God. And you let God correct the man of God. God bless you.